My name is Rachel Black, and I'm with the Asset Building Program at New America. Uh, thank you all so much for sticking it out with us. I'm so glad to see so many of you still here. Um, I'm really excited to be moderating our last panel. I think it comes at uh, you know a really great conversational arc in the context of what we've been talking about. You know, for uh, the last day and a half, we've talked about um, specific policy challenges that have been facing millennials. Uh, we heard before lunch uh, some really interesting conversation about the challenges that millennials sort of face engaging with the policy making structures that they interact with. So in this conversation, we're really going to be melding those two together through the framework of uh, a social contract for millennials, sort of piecing those two ideas, the, uh, the policies um, and the institutions and government uh, into sort of one cohesive frame. And to do that, uh, we're going to start out hearing from our, our powerhouse panel, um, Mark Schmidt, who is the director of the Policy Reform Program at New America, Taylor Joe Eisenberg, who is the vice president of networks at the Roosevelt Institute, and Perry Bacon Jr., who is a senior political reporter for NBC News. And you all, you all are our fourth panelist. Um, I'm going to pose a set of questions to the panel, and I want everyone to feel free to weigh in, uh, or however you feel so moved. If you have a question, please pose that too. Um, before we jump in, just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, first, we have a hard stop at 1.45. I'm sure that this will be very engaging and interesting and we'll want to continue to the conversation, but we have a very quick room turnover. So if you just all stand up and move the conversation outside, that'd be much appreciated. Um, last thing, just a couple notes of thanks. First to our graphic recorder, who's been doing an amazing job recording <laughs> our conversation. And just a note of thanks to uh, the New America staff who have done just an amazing job producing the event today, our AV staff, uh, Liana Simmons with our event staff. Um, this is the first time we've been in this space. I think it looks awesome. Uh, I think if you agree with me, clap your hands. Great. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, so first, I'd just like to hear from each of you sort of your view of the world. You've heard uh, a, a fairly far-ranging conversations. Um, what, are your, what are your reflections? What are you, the, the pieces that you think we should sort of tease out when we're thinking about sort of the construction of a social contract for millennials? Um, sure. Um, well, thank you very much, Rachel. It's great to be on this panel with current and former colleagues, and I really appreciate all the work that you've done on this on this conference. Um, I'll just make a couple, try to be as quick as possible in making a couple observations. I was struck, um, well, Taylor, Joe, and I were at a conference uh, last week with mostly people who were a very small number of millennials, one of those conferences where I was probably below the median age, unlike this one. Um, and somebody who was a millennial start said, you know, in, it, millennials are really important because in 20 years we're going to be like really at the center of power and everything. I was kind of like, you know what? You know, a millennial could be the next president in 2016. We're really talking not about people who are super young. Or Wendy Spencer used the word adults for, you know, it's kind of astonishing. This is people who are really at the heart of our of your working lives and some who are heading towards that, towards that point. So I think we should think of it as a little bit, not just what what works for millennials, but kind of what, what's going on in the economy right now and people who are millennials kind of are experiencing this economy at its fullest, as opposed to people like me. We live in this economy now, but we also had time in a previous uh, economy. So I kind of think we should think about it a little bit in those terms, like you know, what's what's the what's the situation of the economy we're we're in right now, and how do you answer it? And you know, thinking about the political engagement panel, my kind of naive political theory is like the first thing you want to ask is. Do you actually, is the political system actually providing answers that are persuasive to helping people move into the process? I don't think you can say, oh, people should be doing this, that, or the other thing until you actually look back and say, have we got something for people? Is there something here that's, that's answering people's stresses and, uh, 
situation, and, I, and I'm not sure we quite do. Um, and, and I think we should really challenge ourselves to, uh, as to whether we have adequate answers. I think that when you talk about the economy and the situation of people who are, who are kind of moving into it or at, at the heart of their careers, there are two things that struck me about it from the uh, previous two days. One is a lot of the life cycle is kind of compressed. So the period between paying off your student loans, beginning to save, you know, really getting to the more costly parts of, of, of having a family, that's a very compressed period. And then, of course, on the other side, retirement savings, which we didn't talk about at all, is, is, a, is an even more stressful thing. So the standard life pattern is, is, a, is, is quite different. And the other thing I was struck by, particularly in the work-family conversation today, is there are, very, there are two very different worlds of work. And one of it is like what Anne Marie Slaughter was talking about today, or yesterday, which is the organization I work for, super flexible, lots of autonomy, lots of opportunity, and there's a whole other world that's increasingly really, really the opposite of that, um, that, that people were talking about. And, and, and there's a gulf between, we don't, always, we don't always know people who work in that world, and that used to be there were terrible, stressful jobs, but at least they, they were compensated with some pay, largely because of unions, we're in a very different world. So I think we should kind of acknowledge that. Um, uh, and. I think they're thinking about the social contract. I think of a couple different models we should think of. You know, the classic social contract is social insurance. There are situations you encounter in life, and you're going to kind of collectively insure yourself against those in advance: retirement, disability, health, and so forth. And the the, the student loan system, for example, is a kind of social insurance of its own. You're paying for it after rather than before. And with the newer income contingent repayments, it's really that classic model. But those are all based on specific situations in life, and they're kind of based on, and we need to make those things work, we need to make unemployment insurance work, but they're based on, on predictable events and assumptions about the life cycle, and I think we need to, to revisit those. Um, the second way of, the, the other aspect of a social contract that we've always talked about here is assets can be helping people build assets, whether it's home ownership, savings, accounts for education, that can be a kind of social contract that kind of helps protect people without necessarily focusing on those specific things. And I think that's an important aspect uh, of it as well. The third piece is detaching some of that social contract from work. And I think as work becomes kind of tougher and more you know, in a sense, every corporation is kind of tightening its costs and things like that. It's much more important to make those make those protections things that belong to people and not as a condition of employment. With I think the ACA being one small first step in that in that direction. And then I think we need to think about what's going on, and particularly with things that are developing now, and driven obviously by 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 people under 35. There's an interesting phenomenon where I think there's a mistrust of a general mistrust of government. Uh, not not radically different from other generations, but not not uh, not not a full rebound to kind of the New Deal generation either. Um, a fair amount of distrust of government, but a big trust in fairly collective solutions, often at a large scale, often technological. I mean, Care.com, for example, which was represented here earlier, is a pretty large scale child you know uh, child care, elder care, a whole bunch of other things that people are putting a lot of faith in. People put a lot of faith in Airbnb. You're kind of throwing into the unknown in some of these things. So I think that's an interesting challenge. Can we recreate some collective, should government kind of model itself after some of these large scale collective organizing uh, uh, projects that have, that have taken place or should we kind of give over to that? I think that's a really interesting um, uh, question. What, what are the costs of kind of putting so much collective action in these in these private uh, agencies. And then I think the third thing, and I'll be quick, is I do think, especially when you hear about work and family, I think it's really important not to let big employer, big companies off the hook. I think it's I think there's that that the the, the relentless pressure to kind of cut costs and cut stability and and, uh, and, and so forth that we're seeing throughout the economy is, is something we've got to address. I, mean, is, I think corporate governance has something to do with that. But it, you know, obviously, unions would be a great answer. If it's not that, you, we need to find other ways to do those things. And it's just a, it's just a very, it's a, it's a much crueler world than it needs to be, given the level of, of prosperity that actually exists in, in our country. So that's probably too long.
<clears throat> yeah, so I first want to say thank you to New America. We are really excited to partner on this event. I um, participate in a lot of different venues and spaces that are talking about millennials, and um, it's always heartening to be in the ones that were very thoughtful and nuanced on this stuff versus a lot of tokenization and, um, you know, tech millennials, you equal technology. That's, my, that's what I'm taking away from this, right? So there's, we really appreciate the level of thoughtness and the conversation that we've had um, over the past day and a half. Um, so I work with um, the Roosevelt Institute, and more specifically with our Roosevelt Networks, um, which includes our campus network, which is a network of 120 chapters across the country and 38 different states of students doing policy work. So we, in a lot of ways, are building and training the next generation of policy wonks who are beginning to take on um, these issues now. I'm excited that we have a few of them in the room here today. So. Um, I kind of, when I was going through the last two days, and I don't want to you know, repeat all the phenomenal things that other people said, a lot of really smart people talking about a lot of really important things, but I, I think one of the things that I took away when we're talking about the social contract is we need to be thinking about um, some of the frameworks within the, that, those social contracts. And the obvious ones are the ways that the panels are organized, talking about the new economy, talking about wealth, social, political participation. But there's also some cross-cutting frameworks that um, I picked up across panels um, that really interesting to me in terms of thinking out okay, what are these new frameworks and again it's not that they're new frameworks specifically for millennials it's just they're new frameworks for the time that we're in and millennials are bearing the brunt um, of the repercussions of those new frameworks so the one is this question on the American dream that was something across the board that people talked about we need to readjust our assumptions around what the American dream is and who is attainable for um, the second was being explicit about race and class um, I think somebody made a really interesting comment yesterday that it's really important is that millennials are very class conscious in a way that there was a lot of overarching narrative that we were moving away from. I don't think that's true. And how we be explicit and how we understand race and class and its implications in our policy making. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that millennials are 40% people of color. Um, and we aren't talking enough about that. The, Third is you know questions around work and family. Um, the one of our speakers earlier today also talked about the third elements: work, family, and community, um, which is an important aspect for millennials. Or how what are their new frameworks for thinking out those things coming together? Um, the next would be again intersection of problem solving. Um, for those who participated in the policy breakouts yesterday, there was oh, I got louder. Um, there was a um, a lot of conversation about we can't talk about you know these economic issues without talking about the state of higher education, and so. So what are the frameworks for our problem solving that help us um, realize that and, and bring all the different pieces and conversations together that need to happen? Um, the next one's my favorite. It's talking about what Mark hit on, um, networks and institutions. Um, there's so many interesting things that young people are doing to elevate the issues they care about, whether it's looking at the dreamers around immigration, um, whether it's looking at the young people helping to drive Occupy, whether it's looking at what's happening in Ferguson right now. Uh, but there tends to be a disconnect between the networks that are thriving and being driven by young people and the institutions of power that are positioned to, in some ways, to institutionalize where these young people are coming at. And that disconnect is causing a lot of problems. And that fits in you know, very clearly with the conversation around the way that our social and political um, participation models are changing and shifting, whether it's looking at things like participatory budgeting, whether it's looking about the role of technology in politics. Um, and the last is um, looking at a new frameworks around how we think about wealth, and debt, and stability. Um, so there were some really fascinating comments made yesterday about how millennials aren't as you know, ready to enter into debt. Um, and what does that mean? Um, thinking about the fact that stability is an extraordinarily important thing for young people who have grown up in a time of instability. And so what are the implications of that when we think about, again, our wealth, debt, and stability frameworks? And then I just wanted to share a few observations um, beyond just talking about that, some of the interesting framework concepts um, as well. As up on the stage, when a young person was on a panel, it's, there was immediately discussion of power. And I think that's a really important thing to note um, because young people don't feel like they generally have it. And a lot of times when young people are talked about, it's left out of the conversation. But when you bring them in, they're talking about it because they know what it's like not to have it. And when they feel a sense of helplessness because institutions are aligned, aligned against them. Um, and so I think that's um, a good justification for making sure that, in Mark's point, they are in positions now where they should be a part of these conversations. Um, the second is that there are two distinct millennial experiences. I mean, there's tons 
tons of millennial experiences, but there's two distinct ones. There's the one that is more common in the media narrative around um, the entrepreneur, um, the startup, um, the person who's taking the reins, but there's also these 6.7 million young people who are not in school and not in work. Um, that is a distinct experience that is very different from the one that uh, is focused in on, as people talked about yesterday, the barista effect, the overeducated young person who is working at a coffee shop. Um, and I think that's an uh, important thing. Again, it comes back because it's, we're leaving out a whole economic strata and a whole conversation about um, how people of color, particularly young people of color, are generally still not um, doing well in this economy. And then the next one was trust. So we talked a lot about trust in terms of government and young people trusting government and institutions, but there was a really good conversation yesterday around financial institutions. So we had somebody up here who was using you know, some new financial tools, and um, someone made the comment that young people are trust tech companies way more than they trust financial institutions. And so the role of trust for this generation and the repercussions of the Great Recession around that um, and what that means for the policy mechanisms that we put in place. So. And uh, Rachel, when we talked about politics a little bit and sort of how do millennials you know, use the political process and get more political power and influence the debates that are happening in Washington and around the country as well. So I'm going to make three points about that. The first one being that all the data shows that millennials tend to live in and want to live in cities. And that's a really important lever of power. We don't think about it this way, but Harris County is the county that includes Houston. 4.3 million people live there. That's more people than live in 24 states. 8 million people live in New York. That's all, that's, that would be the 13th biggest state in the country that became a state. So Bill de Blasio has a lot more influence than you think he does. And if you can change his views on something, then you've changed the lives of a lot of millennials. And that's a lot easier than changing Congress. A lot of, we talk about policy making tends to be about what's Washington doing, what's Congress doing. We should always think more about what are cities doing, what are states doing. It's much easier to change a city, and a lot of people live in cities. The partisanship, the partisan gridlock doesn't really exist at the city level the way it does at the Washington level, because a lot of cities are controlled by one mayor of one party or the other party. It's a lot easier to change. So a lot of the changes I, I hear about that would help millennials and others are already happening in a lot of places. Raising the minimum wage, the idea of banning the box, meaning you don't have to check a box to say what your criminal record is, which affects minorities disproportionately. Uh, expanding pre-kindergarten education. Requiring policemen to wear cameras in some way. It's something that's been talked about since what happened in Ferguson. Encouraging schools to suspend kids less. These things are all actually a great ideas, and a lot of them are actually already happening in a lot of places. So one big lever is to think about cities one and then states two, because the gridlock is happening, not, the gridlock is happening in Washington, but most states increasingly are controlled by one party or the other party, and that gives you another lever as well, because when you're talking about states, there's an ability to change things, because most people don't think Texas is going to turn blue or Maryland is going to turn red anytime soon. So there's, well, there's more incentive there for politicians to work on the problems because they're not thinking about who's going to win the next election, who's going to take over power in the future. There's not going to be a Republican governor of Maryland anytime soon or a Democratic governor of Texas anytime soon. So you can use the lever of the states, and I think that's another key one to think about in terms of how do millennials use the political process to change things. The second thing that I think is really important is to think about is millennials, unlike the rest of our politics, are not divided, our previous generations are not divided by race one and religion two. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of people grew up in the 1960s, in that era where um, you have civil rights legislation, you have busing, you have the fight over that. And then you have people who grew up in the 1980s and the, and the fact that they felt like cities, there were all these problems with cities and there was urban crime and so on. And millennials have not grown up in that ideal. They're a much more diverse generation. They, there's not the white-black divide is not the same there. There's Hispanics. There's m many more biracial people. So those kinds of d divides are gone. And the religious divide, is, you know, as millennials increasingly are, call themselves nuns in terms of religion, meaning they don't identify with any kind of religion at all. That's an important divide too. I mean, a lot of po politics spends its time dividing people on those two factors, race and religion. And millennials won't have those kind of divides. And when we talk about the power of millennials, we should acknowledge that 
I know all the data says millennials are increasingly independent and they're increasingly out of the political process. That's one set of data. The other set of data suggests that millennials actually did play a big role in electing the current president and he's done a lot of policy that millennials would like and that the uninsured rate among young people is like plunging because of Obamacare. There's been a lot of work on student loans by the administration already. So when I hear millennials occasionally are powerless, I'm sort of like, the White House in October released a memo about what their policies are for millennials now and in the future. When you get a memo released in October of an election year, that means you're a powerful political group. They already care about you, and that's a good sign. It suggests that like they care about the elderly, like they care about Hispanics, like they care about blacks, they care about millennials as an institution already. So that is a way to wield power. I mean, one of the things if I was designing the millennial strategy of the future is to figure out how do I get, how do I take my ideas and make sure Hillary Clinton, Chris Christie, Rand Paul, et cetera, are taking those ideas forward because Obama, I would argue, already did acknowledge the power of millennials and actually work with them to a great extent. Um, the third thing that I think is a really powerful lever is the media has such a big power in terms of what we talk about, what problems we think are problems. And you can tell millennials are already affecting the media a lot. We mentioned that a little bit earlier, the, the kind of the dreamers, how they're coming up to politicians and asking them, are you going to deport me? Are you not going to? This has become like viral video. 60-year-olds aren't doing that. But when the dreamers did that with Rand Paul, that was on, all, that was on cable news all day long. And, that, and politicians are very affected by what's in the news. Like millennials help make Ferguson big in the news and then Barack Obama was reacting to it. And that's really important to think about that kind of media lens as well. And the fourth thing is related to this as well is it's important I think for millennials, for, as we talk about millennials to define what the problem is exactly because I think the biggest problem is, and this affects how it's covered, is millennials have this big challenge in terms of they had all this college debt. They, were in a, they, they graduated from college at a time where there were any jobs. They went to graduate school. So they had even more debt than previous generations. If you think of that is the sort of the, one of the core problems of millennials, you probably would write fewer stupid articles about how, gee, I wonder why millennials live with their parents so long. That's like a dumb concept for stories. Most of the stories are written all the time, but I think it's in part a failure of people like us to define one of the core challenges of millennials is they have this huge amount of debt. So of course they're living with their parents more than people who graduated from college in 1997 when unemployment was very, very low. So if you think about that, so we think about how do we define the problem to the media, like if I ran Young Invincibles, I would think every time Time Magazine wrote a stupid story about how many millennials live at, their, live at their parents' house, make sure to flood them with tweets and letters saying, the average debt of this generation is this much money. So of course we're thinking about ways in order to spend less on housing. So there really, really is an effect, a way to like change how the media tells the story, and that'll change the story itself. That's great. Um, I think where I want to start is, Taylor, you had alert, uh, alluded to um, viewing the challenges with millennials maybe less in terms of how they're distinct from other generations and more in terms of how the degree to which they're experiencing those problems is heightened by sort of the economic circumstances that we're in. And when we're thinking about policy responses to those challenges, um, you know, I, I'm wondering um, how useful the millennial frame then is. Uh, we heard from Bessie Stevenson earlier, and she walked us through what the White House's agenda um, for, um, for millennials looks like, and it very much looks like an agenda for uh, you know, shared opportunity and prosperity, something that speaks to labor, labor market access, uh, educational access, uh, health care, uh, in, in response to the White House's plan, Matt Iglesias, who we heard from yesterday, um, wrote that um, actually in terms of uh, looking at policy solutions, um, looking at a prism of class or race uh, or gender might actually be more instructive given the diversity of the generation and the universality of the needs uh, that are uh, sort of met by it. So I'd really like to get sort of your, your reaction to that. Yeah, well, I think um, I think it was Matt Iglesias who wrote an article last week that was essentially saying that um, the White House is essentially proposal around millennials is a proposal which should be just general for the economy, but tailored just a little bit towards millennials. I think that was one critique of that. Um, yeah, it's funny because I think um, uh, 
you know, we've been talking about millennials for like seven or eight years as a concept, and it's steadily gained steam. And the funny part is that the policy world is by far the last group to talk about it. Uh, that it was particularly in the marketing world and um, the tech world, like they had an interest in being at the forefront of understanding the changing trends of young people. And so they've been, they've been talking about this for a while, and it's only like in the past like, like three, four years or so that you know the political and policy world has been like, what is happening? Um, and I think the funny part is, is I just saw uh, a few weeks ago a marketing uh, firm come out with a new report on Generation Z. They're already talking about the people who are about to turn of college age who are distinct in their um, trends that are different from millennials, that they actually even are less trusting, that, but at the same time, they're much more collective oriented versus millennials, what they call sharing oriented. Um, and so the part of, I think, the challenge of the millennial or the um, generational framework work um, is that again it's not holistic and often it changes really quickly but I think the more important thing that I would take away from what you're talking about um, is that the policy political world and institutions are generally have been a little bit behind on some of this stuff and so how do we adjust and um, start being quicker and more responsive when it comes to our policy making. Um, because there is important things that are relevant to millennials as a framework in terms of how we think about policy. And it will be the same for Generation Z. And I also think it's an, um, much more complicated. Your point is that you know we do have people who don't necessarily identify as black or white anymore. And there's changing dynamics in race. Gender in itself is changing. And if you think about the conversation around transgender, all of these are different prisms in which we need to see this work. Um, and so I would exclude generation but I don't think it's the only one that we can look to like as a panacea to understand the shifts and changes that we're going through. Thanks, and I invite either one of our other panelists as well as you in the audience to weigh in on this too. If you uh, care to make a contribution, just flag down uh, our staff member with, uh, with a microphone. Perry or Mark, do you care to weigh in? I, in? No, she answered the question. Taylor, 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 Taylor. Taylor. Taylor, you knocked it out of the park. Well done. Uh, so when we think about uh, when we think about a social contract, really, it is a balance of individual needs and um, sort of reciprocity on the part of government or other institutions who are creating creating these policies. And I think what we've heard a lot about throughout uh, the last day and a half is that these institutions are failing in myriad ways. Right, you know, Mark, you made reference to. Um, sort of the lack of uh, sort of re retirement security options. Employers are less likely to be offering uh, sort of defined benefit plans. Of course, employees are also much more mobile. Um, they're also less likely to have access to employer-provided health care. And that's sort of just on the employer side, you know, on the government side. Um, we've heard issues related to sort of the responsiveness of government, um, how representative government is, and of course the problem of a government just sort of uh, actively disenfranchising uh, large amounts of people who sh should have a voice in the decisions that sort of make their lives um, make their lives better. So what kind of changes, and Perry, I'd love to start with you, what kind of changes with the government in particular do you feel like we need to see for any, uh, any meaningful change in a policy agenda that helps the millennial generation or others advance? Or we could start with somebody else. Let me start with Mark. Let me think about what I want to say. <laughs> well, I think Mark's telling you this a lot. I mean, right. I mean, this is this is kind of the main thing that I try to think about. I don't do any. I don't I haven't solved any problems yet, but I've I tried to. Um, no, I mean, the failure of government to respond. I mean, we could talk about what we think ideal policies would be. We don't have a governing system that's able to do that right now. Um, they're, they're good proposals. They're things that can sometimes be done by executive order. I think they're tremendous things that were done in the first year of the Obama administration on whether it's student loans or the ACA. Not much since then. It's a broken process. And it's a very difficult process because of the, because of the you know, absolute partisanship. It's a very difficult process to inject an idea in because it's very hard to have an idea have leverage unless, it gets, unless it's picking up some, some support in different parts of the political spectrum. 
you know, and you can kind of leverage those things against each other to make it happen. Um, at best, you have an idea that either takes hold in the Republican channel or takes hold in the Democratic channel. Um, but it's even even in a, even in the cases where where Democrats have 60 votes in the Senate, it's still very very hard to pull that off. And that's a very different political world than you know when I worked on Capitol Hill less than about 18 years ago. That's a you know that was a world where there were all kinds of different kinds of coalitions and deals you could cut and alliances you could form. And it was, you know, you didn't get everything done. It was still a tough environment, but things moved. But we don't have that now. And, you know, we do have to think about what's a structure that could make some of those things happen. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I, I do think, I think money in politics has something to do with it. I don't think it has everything to do with it. I think George Chung um, from the Joyce Foundation kept trying to raise the idea of do we need a different kind of party structure that gives a little more, you know, creates some opportunity for other kinds of formations to emerge. I, I used to be kind of okay, lukewarm about that, and now I'm kind of, thinking, I don't know that there's really an alternative. I mean, if you do some, something like ranked choice voting that kind of gives different people different ways to participate, gives politicians different incentives to kind of get out there and actually offer people something that doesn't fall into one of the established channels, I, I think we have to think about ideas like that. Like I was saying, like I was saying a little earlier, I think that changing Washington is sort of unrealistic right now, and you might want to think about other levers of corporate, yeah, whether it's yeah. like foundations, whether it's cities, whether it's states, whether it's counties, as opposed to, I think we generally, if we all agree, what policies would help millennials best, we could probably come up with a pretty decent list of what to do, and I think that's what Maddie Glacier was writing about in some ways, too. The policies that would help millennials and help the rest of us, I think we have a pretty decent sense of. How to get them through, I think, is the challenge, and then I would want that, and I think is going to require a a little more creativity, a little less kind of, uh, the instinct um, among all people is like, why isn't Obama doing X? And I think we all have the answer to that, so. And I, and I think, this, oh, sorry, I think this is where millennials are actually really get it, I mean, to your point about cities, right? Like we, in our network with our students, like the locals where their head is at, that is where they're thinking about trying to do policy change work. And we also did, this um, big project over the course of a few years, um, where the first year the students were building essentially a poli uh, policy blueprint. What kind of country do we want to inherit by the year 2040? What kind of policies do we need to put in place on education, environment, um, the economy? Followed up with a budget to demonstrate they could pay for it, and also to demonstrate to people they weren't idealists, like this was a matter of political choices that they need to make. But the last piece of what happened is the students said, okay, we have a vision for what we want. We know we can pay for it if we're willing to make those hard political choices, but our system is too broken to respond to us as, as a political cohort. And so we actually need to talk about what government needs to look like in the 21st century. And it's a really, I think it's a really creative and interesting conversation. There's definitely the, you know, the, 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 the questions around the party system, the questions around polarization and its impact. Um, but there's also also just about thinking about new models of participation and input, um, and that with a generation in general that's very ownership driven, I think that's where you see, and participatory driven, um, there's some really some interesting questions like I don't think we've fully been able to wrap our heads around um, about the way that we can get a political system that is responsive and reflective in, in, in a timeline that actually is responsive to the needs of the moment. I just want to cha not not challenge Perry, but just like raise the the issue. I mean, yes, cities are great. I think the idea that you know we're kind of we're post the corrupt machine city and post the crime ridden city. I mean, the fact that we're sitting at you know seventh uh, and wherever we are ninth and ninth and N is it you know we wouldn't have been here uh, 15 years ago. Um, it, it's a really big deal in almost every city, uh, probably outside of Detroit, even Camden, New Jersey, where I used to try to do some. Work work is, is, is picking up. It's a really big deal. I hate the idea. First, there are things that mayors can't do. And mayors can't create a student loan system and make it work, for example. Um, and second, I kind of hate the idea that we're going to move into a zone where we kind of have these cities and counties where lots of progressive things are being tried, lots of great things are happening, and then, you know, the majority of people living in Mississippi are living in the same situation that they lived in before, the, you know, the, 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 the 50 poorest counties, 50 poor counties that sweep from you know West Virginia down into Georgia and uh, and Northern Alabama, and we're just gonna you know kind of shrug about that because we're pretty happy with our you know nice art galleries here. I, I, I just I, I don't want to be too complacent about living in that world. I, 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 I think we have to have some federal 
a, a role for federal policy. It may be useful to think about problems that require lots of money and lots of economic change and, and problems that don't. Like, you know, millennials overwhelmingly favor the, uh, gay marriage, and that is happening because it doesn't require lots of money. So there are certain things millennials favor that don't require lots of dollars, and that kind of is a way to, th maybe a way to think about where things that are very expensive, things that require, that require the federal government versus things that don't. All right, and with that, we're going to open it up to, uh, to questions for the panel. So if you have questions you want to, there's a comment that you weren't able to raise during your policy <coughs> workshop or something that people just didn't pay attention to. Uh, now is the time to air it. Uh, so please raise your hand. We're going to start with Ray. Yeah, hi. Ray Boshara, St. Louis Fed. Um, you know, since this is a panel on the social contract, as you know, the social contract is heavily tilted towards the end of life and not so much towards the beginning. Um, recently, the Urban Institute, Senator, former Senator Bob Carey, uh, folks at Cato, you know, left and right have made a point of how tilted resources are towards, uh, you know, previous generations. And, um, you know, there was even one study that showed, I think the boomers might have been the last generation to actually get more out of government than they, <clears throat> than they put in. And you know, millennials are actually—it's kind of a net. It's a—it's a, it's another form of debt. You know, they're—they're they're putting some money into the system, um, and they're getting a lot less in return. I guess the question is—is is that too big of an issue? Like, is this too big for you? Should we worry about that massive allocation of resources, and just think about very concrete, specific things to be doing instead? So, and I just wonder about that. The contract is reversed in many ways for how it should be. Um, and is that something you think that we should be doing something about? So I'll say this is, um, it's interesting. I think sometimes, in some ways, it's a perfect example of how we can't talk about economics of any kind of generation without talking about political. Um, like a lot of people will point to the reason why that is is because young people don't have the equivalent of the AARP. And there's definitely been tons of efforts to think about building an ARP equivalent for young people. I'm pretty sure I have three or four people approach me a year asking me, I have this idea, an ARP for young people. It's like, how long? Um, but, uh, and you know, there's definitely been serious efforts on that front. And it, my kind of a thought about that is it's not reflecting where young people want to plug in and the concept of building this very bureaucratic, heavy civic institution is not the direction that that needs to happen in. Um, but uh, the interesting part about young people is like, they're, they're really supportive of things like Social Security. Um, that, and this goes back to some of the trends that we talked about yesterday, is that the generational conflict piece is not there. And there's actually a lot of um, right-leaning organizations have tried to create that generational conflict. Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's different conversations about how much young people should be getting annoyed about you know, how many resources are going towards older generations. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a go. I don't, I don't think people are going to respond well from, from a political standpoint. But from an economic standpoint, I think it's different. I mean, just, just to reverse that, though, can is there a well on part of current you know, older generations to but is there also a, a sort of a similar sentiment like we've done very well as you know a, you know most seniors have at least historically and compared to previous generations is there a similar well like we need to be doing more for for younger generations do you see that as well i, I I'm, I'm i'm pretty uncomfortable with that kind of generational accounting approach i'd like to put more resources really into children, not necessarily into, I mean, there's a reason why we put resources at the end of life. I mean, it's that's when you're unable to work and incur significant health expenses and so forth. You know, so I'd rather put much more resources into children, for sure, without necessarily saying that that has to come at the expense of a different generation. I don't think that's the, that's a, I mean, I want, I think, I think we should spend less on Medicare because, because, it, because it's inefficient in the way it operates, not because this generation is getting too much. And I think in terms of who's done well, who hasn't, I think we need to kind of get to the point where we shift away from the old tax conversation, which was about, you know, uh, uh, only people above $250,000 need to, you know, need to actually contribute more. I think, I think there's a lot of us, of many generations, who are not over $250,000, but frankly, we've done really quite well, and we need to contribute more to the, to, to, into the social safety net. And that's not a generational conversation. But I like a, the okay. idea of framing a social contract. We sort of have one for older people already, which says, you will not die in poverty. You will have health insurance when you, until you die. Should we have something for 
younger people where you will have the right to a high quality high school education. You will have the right to go to college without being drained in debt where you can't take any job. Yes, should we talk about that and should we lay that out in some way? I think sure, of course we, in the same way we have, we expect certain things when you're older, we should expect certain things when you're 25 that you have. And I think we should think about how to frame that as a, a you know, the, what is it, the, the Bill Clinton framing is work hard, play by the rules. There should be something like that for people who are younger as well as older and we actually, where we actually think about that. Because you watch politics, you know, which is my job. Politicians are so focused on like, look, you know, some politicians just said we are going to cut Medicare and that is the end of time and they run ads focused on that, both parties. You rarely see, you don't see as much a politician is going to make it much more hard to go to college and this is what we should attack them. It would be great if we had equal emphasis in our system on the young as we did the old and I think that does go a little bit to voting patterns and so on. Well, let me follow up on that. I think that's a really interesting point, though, that we have such a robust uh, safety net and set of social insurance programs that help uh, the elderly and senior citizens at that point in their life. But when we see what we would, I think, assume to be sort of uh, comparable supports for a millennial or younger generation, uh, like uh, student aid financing, I mean, this is where we've seen a lot of divestment. Um, you know, states are actually spending less and shifting the risk onto individuals rather than sort of stepping up and making additional investments. So what do you think it's going to take to make sort of that argument? Well, I mean, I think we're, I think it's one of the, the there's a little bit of, of, of shuffling, right? I mean, we're, we're disinvesting in public education itself at the same time that we're actually increasing costs on, you know, increasing a shift onto loans so that people are bearing a higher burden. And, and that balance needs to be needs to be shifted. I don't think it's helpful to do that as a contrast with, okay, we've done this great thing for seniors because, I mean, it's not, I mean, Social Security isn't adequate for people's retirement. Um, it's, it's established, it's said, it's better than, in some ways it's better than uh, what you have for younger people, but it's not, I, I don't think that contrast is really helpful because it, it, it leads you to kind of denigrate an incredible achievement that we have. So what is the framing or the narrative that we need to be employing? Well, I think the framing is that certain things are public, like education is can be good. treated as a public good. I mean, it's not, not technically a public good in the, in the economist term, but it's a, you know, it's something we ought to be providing, not, not, run, not making it super expensive and then letting people borrow massive amounts against their future earnings to get it. Many, of pe many people who will make, a, will make a bad judgment or be encouraged to make a bad judgment about whether that education will actually lead to those future earnings. And I would say that um, I think this is where like the falsities of the concept of the American dream hurt young people much more because if, I mean I'm sure most every time a young person hears a politician, well back in my day I was able to work my part time job to get through college, but you should be able to save and take on the debt in the meantime. A lot of it is there's a pure misconception about the lack of security that there is for you know um, young people and you know including you know kids and young adults, young people, um, and so part of that's both shifting and recognizing a lack of security, whether it's not whether it's framing as a social contract or not, it's about actually having a very overt conversation about the lack of security around this age group, the long-term implications of that, um, and essentially, what do we again? What are our public goods that we're going to put in place to ensure that that you know the, the, the first as um you know they were mentioning earlier is that the first step on the staircase is there, and that people can actually continue to climb it. So I mean, I would frame it as the goal is you have a high quality education in college and you don't have huge amounts of debt and you, have the, and you have a chance to get a job afterward. We can then go to policies, I'm sure we talked about yesterday, which are we should get rid of for-profit colleges that have huge, you know, cost a lot of money and then leave people in huge debt so they can't get jobs. We can lead, once we start from that big goal, you, that we have policies that we know, it's not that we're not spending enough money probably on higher education. We're not spending in the right way. I mean, there are states that have merit-based merit financial aid programs of, you know, you can make a million dollars and you still be qualified for some kind of uh, scholarship. And that's probably unwise considering we have so many people with so much such huge debt. I feel like if we almost detail the problem a little better, it might be, you can solve it a little better too. Great. All right, next question. I think, Sabil, you had a question, didn't you? Did I see your hand? Yeah, so just off of that last discussion, uh, to what extent is, is so where, where does the taxation of uh, private, either private wealth or um, corporations fit into the story? Because so you mentioned sort of philanthropies and a couple of other things, but there's a lot of 
there's a lot of dollars flowing through the economy, but relatively little of it, or less and less of it, is flowing through the public sector, and that's part of what's behind the rise of student debt and the hollowing out of public education and the hollowing out of the state itself. And so where does that fit into the conversation we're having so far? I would just say one of the great fears that I have is, and again, the data shows that young people overall support this concept of the common good and the role of government and public institutions in securing some of those baseline entities. My fear, though, is that with the privatization that's happening a lot of this stuff, that there will become a new norm and that there won't be, that younger people won't have the framework to say, actually, these things are that I have, a, a, I deserve a good quality education, um, that I deserve quality health care, that the pr privatization element of some of this stuff means that the new norms, well, they won't even have a framework to think about what they should be versus what is. I just put that out there. Yeah, I mean, I think we're relying so much. I mean, I think there's a great model for in which things like private charity and foundations kind of model and test ideas, and then government picks up the ones that work. I kind of like that model. It's a very 1960s Ford Foundation model of how the world works. And But now I think we're in the zone where it's like because government is disinvesting, we're totally relying on you know the private sector and philanthropy to do things like figure out the common core standards for us, you know, or or, or actually build the buildings on every university or fund the research or things like that. We're 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 and that's and I, yeah, I do think there's a, a great case for saying that we need to move some of that into the public sector where it's actually subject to democratic decision making and picks up the things that work, not just the whims of you know Bill Gates at a current at a particular moment in time. I guess my view is we sort of know what policies might fix that, and the way you framed it is ultimately, like the, the data now shows that the biggest thing that divides people in the world in America is not race or religion, but politics. And you framed that in a very, I'm going to say, left way. And that would be, in a, and I, if I was trying to solve millennial problems, I, I wouldn't start with, I would start with the solution and maybe the problem and maybe not the politics, because that's what is dividing us. Well, to follow up on that, I mean, Perry, you started by saying, you know, policies that are moving these days are often ones that don't cost any money, right? And I think what Ray was arguing is that inertia is very powerful, right? We already have these very entrenched, uh, very expensive policies, sort of by virtue of being on the books uh, for as long as they have and having sort of very broad-based constituencies and just sort of expectations uh, that they'll continue to exist, they continue to exist. And uh, when we're talking about the con making the kind of investments that are required to meet really these fundamental needs that um, millennials and future generations are going to continue um, continue to have, I mean, we encounter questions sort of like Sabeel's. It's like, well, where's the money? Where's the offset? How are you going to pay for that? Right? And that's a very kind of distinct experience. So, I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your perspective about um, really what it's going to take to actually advance the kind of agenda that uh, sort of employs some of the policies that we've been talking about. Yeah. What's going to take to advance? Can you fix this problem? <laughs> Can you fix this problem? I mean, I mean, as I said earlier, I mean, there was a, there were lots of people under age 35 who were uninsured six years ago, and they have insurance now. I think that's a model for change. Electing someone who, you know, whatever you define, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm nonpartisan, so I don't want to get too much, too far into the zone here of who you should vote for. But I think it gets, it gets to the point of like, if there, it's all whatever group we're talking, whatever group I talk to, it's always like list your policies. You know, bring them to the candidate. Figure out the candidates for them. If that candidates for them, support that person. If they're not for them, support the other person. I just think that model of political change is not, to me, dead yet. I mean, I think it's a, you know, you know millennials are for gay marriage. One of the persons was for that and ran the president. He won. I mean, I think there is a, a little bit of a simplistic way to put that, but it's like if you, if most millennial goals are achieved right now by the Democratic Party, maybe they should vote for the Democratic Party. So. I think the one thing I would say is that we also need elected officials who are open and responsive to some of the generational language shifts that are happening, and that means that we can't have the trend that we have now, which Congress is getting older, not younger. Um, and so we need that there, there's, right. again, some elements of the fact 
fact that like you're much more likely to listen to people that have shared your life experience. And there, you know, there was that devastating quote earlier, I forget the exact number, around, um, or it was eight times. White men have eight times the political power in this country, and a large part of that is because their government looks like them. Um, and so I think tying that to the recognition of the that there does, like it's about finding the politicians to support you, but you also need to believe that the politicians are open to what you have to say in the first place, too. So, Mark, why don't you want us to have what you have? I'm, I, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll settle for six for six times. <laughs> I'll trade it away now. I, I mean, and that's a serious, that study is really important and, and powerful. Um, I just want to say, I think, you know, earlier today somebody had said something like, well, we have two corporatist parties that are totally identical, and I don't agree with that. I think Perry's made points. Yeah, obviously, that's, I, that, I don't think that's the case. However, it is very true that it is a lot easier to talk about non-redistributionist politics on both sides of the aisle. I mean, you know, the example that's often used is Andrew Cuomo. Andrew Cuomo goes all in on anything that's basically non-redistributionist. In other words, there's no trade-off. Um, and same-sex marriage, choice, you know, equality in the workplace has some trade-offs, but, you know, they're not directly uh, felt. He's all in on those really reticent on minimum wage, any kind of tax increase, anything that has any kind of redistribution settlement. Well, that reflects that, you know, that if you're spending a lot of your time raising money on Park Avenue, he, among liberals, among people who call themselves liberals, that's a lot of what you're, you're going to get a lot more comfort with same-sex marriage than with a minimum wage increase. And that's kind of the tone of the, of the modern Democratic Party. And, you know, the tone of the Republican Party is all that, plus they're against all the non-redistributionist things like same-sex marriage. Um, so we have to find a way to bring that alternative that accepts that there, there's some level of redistribution that, you know, frankly, I think it does include saying we need people who've done well, who aren't, you know, they're not millionaires, they're not making more than $250,000, but they have a level of security, kind of need to contribute more generally uh, to society, as opposed to saying it's, it's on the side of, of, of the seniors and Social Security, um, but some other ways of talking about a collect of shared obligation to our fellow citizens um, that goes beyond just social liberalism. I mean, a lot of what Mark said, if you wanted to have a panel about how do blacks get more power, how do Latinos get more power, how do young people, I mean, the millennials have a lot of the same problems, which is which is they don't have as much, they don't give as much to campaigns, they're not as rich, so they don't have as much way to do that. And these are some of the same problems other disadvantaged groups have influencing our political system. And that's why I was, in fact, I was sort of joking about the election a little bit, but that's the core is that, um, Maybe we need to have kind of the, uh, the, the environmentalist Tom Steyer. I don't know how old he is, but I don't think he's a millennial. I mean, if we had, if uh, Zuckerberg and Sean Parker got together and like really came up with a millennial agenda of here are the four things. I mean, ultimately, politicians are very responsive to money. This is not news to anybody, but I think that's um, part one of the core problems as well. But they have. I mean, Zuckerberg has that forward U.S. and brought a lot of other young wealthy people into if that. If you worked on an issue project. that. that <laughs> Uh, what's the right framing of this? Uh, Go for it. <laughs> if you worked on an issue that wasn't already sort of already established, like he's working on immigration, right? Yeah, he was. That's the one issue that's already, it moved as far as it's going to move. The president's already behind that. I mean, it wasn't, if they picked an issue that would be useful to have young, young, wealthy um, millennials who picked issues that were maybe not already entrenched in the political system and then raise those if, I mean, we're not going to have like reparations for people who went to graduate college between 2005 and 2000, 2007, <laughs> 2007 and 2011, you know what I'm saying? We're not going to have any, but we need to have some kind of maybe targeted, there are some targeted policies that would help millennials and if you had somebody who really had a lot of credibility raising them, that'd be useful to say. Zuckerberg chose immigration, which I don't, you know, begrudge him for, but that's not necessarily a issue that was lacking in um, advocates. Would you say the same about climate change and Steyer? His money is making a big difference, big, though, in yeah. part because, um, like, the governor of Florida, yeah. he's, politicians are more reluctant to talk about climate change than, if you look at how many Democrats talk about climate change versus how many Democrats talk about immigration reform, is a much smaller uh -huh. number on climate change, I think. I but, hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. All right, we have both an immediacy and a competition question issue. We have time for exactly one oh, more question. So who you. needs to have the last word here? Uh, I have the mic. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, eight, yeah. times, eight times the last word. <laughs> right. I could give it to another white male. But, uh, 
No, um, one of the motivations for this gathering was the kind of observation that the recession has really had a significant impact. And in my framing piece, uh, there was also the observation that it appears that the markers to adulthood are, are changing for this generation vis-a-vis uh, -vis others. And, and one of them is, is, is classic, uh, you know, is, is, on the, is on the wealth building, is on home ownership, kind of the moving, moving forward. And uh, we circulated amongst ourselves an interesting article by a conservative writer who was decrying some of the trade-offs where he, he was saying that, you know, there's not this aspiration for ownership anymore of the younger uh, generation. And it might be that it, it feels unattainable. And he just thought this sounded very un-American and that there was a trade-off that was being, um, you know, considered trading off, you know, inc ownership for, for access, the demand for, for kind of equal access to a number of systems. And, uh, you know, he saw this as a, as a terrible thing. It was going to lead to the ruin in the country. And I'm not so sure. I mean, um, anyway, just wanted to kind of get Mark and, and Taylor's observations on that initially, because I think you had read that piece. And maybe, Mark, you could even summarize if there was other things in that article that were relevant. Um, and is this um, uh, indicative of other kinds of reordering of priorities, uh, aspirations that, that might um, sig signify some kind of you know, generational progress in the uh, days and, and years ahead? Well, just summarize the pieces by uh, James Poulos, who's, who's often really incomprehensible conservative writer. Um, um, but basically, he was. That, that's the argument that he was making: is that if younger people aren't as engaged with ownership, it's going to harm liberty. And he was looking back at, for example, the, the the talk of the ownership society of the early Bush years, and the idea, like, if you and it was part of Social Security privatization, like, if people own things, they're more conservative, they're more protective of liberty because they own their stock or their home or or, or, or whatever. It's all very abstract. Um, and I, I think that's an interest. It's always been an interest interesting contrast in, in politics. I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily true that if you own something, you're necessarily more conservative, but it's a kind of a big theory. And I think it's I mean, I think our obsession with, own, with home ownership, our obsession with home ownership harmed our millions and millions of people. And being, being willing to kind of, you know, when you don't own, you're kind of more engaged in collective activities. You're a renter with others in a building and things like that. So there's a little more of that, you know, responsiveness to the to, to collective obligations, I think, if you're not as obsessed with ownership, ownership, ownership. So yeah, I, th I, th I kind of recommend the article. It's a little bit crazy, but 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 interesting. It was in the Daily Beast, by yeah. the way. And and I would say I you know maybe haven't had enough life experience to have a concrete, but like I don't see the problem. And it's again, it's with like the politics and politics is a little bit late to the game. I, I was telling so if you. Um, uh, Google have Google Alert for millennials. For, like for the past decade or so, it's the car companies and real estate freaking out about the fact that young people aren't buying things. And it also goes back to when you look at the trends that um, that instead of um, seeing status through wealth and status through owning items or having that car or um, you know having being in that neighborhood, um, it's experiences. It's um, being able to travel and being able to do things and like being able to eat, drink that fancy coffee. And or and like you know that's a little bit more for an upper middle class demographic but with the purchasing power, but um, but I personally think access and it's beginning goes back to being also millennials are interested in access for people beyond themselves, right? And I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. I'm a big fan of the move towards collective identity in a sense of community. It might be useful to think: Do we want to have policies that encourage home ownership the way we do now? And do we want to have, you know, we have child care tax credits. We don't have things if you don't have children. And is there a way to think about if generations in the future don't necessarily want to own a home, they're not going to have children, and that's where you know maybe the data suggests is a little bit there. Then should we take that out of the tax system and incentivize other different kinds of behavior? Great, and that's where we'll have to stop. Please join me in thanking our panel.